In Japan, you can find a place to cry and also have a handsome man wipe your tears away. How often do you cry? Also known as rikatsu or tear seeking, the practice is especially popular with women and is said to relieve stress levels. Now, this practice might sound weird to you, but that probably depends from where you're from. One of you asked, why do you cry, or why do some of us have difficulties whilst others don't? If I told you that in Japan some baseball players cry after losing a game, or some people cry during a farewell speech, I'm curious to see how many of you are thinking, how unsportsmanlike, or boys and big girls don't cry. When Ritaro no Nomura cried at a congressional hearing, <laughs> Americans found him more weak than sincere. However, data from the international study on adult crying suggests that the Japanese are among the least likely to cry. Americans, by contrast, are among the most likely. I think what's good about crying therapy with the crying man is that you, you don't actually have to say what you're crying about. So I asked some people from different backgrounds to explain what they think of crying therapy. Do you think it is weird? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen something like this? No, no, that's so no. weird. So weird, so bizarre. If I wanted that kind of service, I would want like the whole package. I think it's a it's a good thing, but it's also it's it made me feel a bit odd, I suppose. The point is, it's a little bit weird for our culture. I think it's a new way of uh, help people huh? that uh, we are not used to seeing. Here you don't find someone who's actually helping you to cry. But I can understand that if you are a Japanese, it's, it's useful. In America, like, that's not a commodity, but it's commodity somewhere else. I, I, I think it's just interesting though how tears is... It's like a big deal. You can go and like pay for, you know, to be emotional in front of someone that you don't know. Um, I suppose it's a different form of therapy, which is good, right? Like if, if you're not, you know, if you feel embarrassed about doing that in public, you know, you can go and, you know, and it's with a handsome man, so. Hiroki Tarai is the mastermind behind this and has written extensively on the subject. In a culture where hiding one's anger and sadness is considered a virtue, he found that showing your vulnerability can bring people together and work better as a team. This idea has also expanded into hotel crying rooms and is even reaching parts of Europe and the US. We know three types of tears, basal, reflex and psychogenic, also known as emotional tears. And that's what interests us the most, because they might contain high levels of toxic chemicals that cause stress. So what that means is tears are literally throwing away our stress. Whilst also producing endorphins, our body's natural painkiller and feel-good hormones. But they could also have the exact same composition of saliva, making everything I said a bunch of baloney. So crying seems to be a sort of catharsis. That is when we purge or relieve emotional tensions. It's a wonderful experience. However, this may not always be the case. According to another international study, whether crying is cathartic depends on the social context, where the effects of crying have actually yielded a mixed set of results. And ultimately, crying too much might not help those with depression or mood disorders. So emotional crying should be a natural stress reliever, however depending from where you are or what you're going through, it might even have the opposite effect. This is perhaps why crying therapy has been so successful. Anthropologically, crying is a social signal, used to expose our feelings in moments of danger or call support from others to better the situation. Receiving social support from others may be critical to experiencing catharsis. I go to the crying therapy? Um, probably not. I think that I would not do it. No. I feel like I don't I I don't have a problem crying. I let go of that crying emotion enough times. I'm just a sensitive per uh, person, so there's no problem for me crying in front of a woman, in front of my girlfriend, in front of my family. But if I need it, yeah. How do you feel when you cry? I feel awful when I'm crying. And it's just horrible, it's horrible. But if you're crying because you're like laughing, it's great, love it. Yeah, after crying, like I do feel a lot better. And usually when I do happen to cry, it's mainly after I am unable to communicate myself. How is crying seen in Iran? I think it's very similar to Europe, but uh, it's more strict. The male should not cry and uh, for the female it's more acceptable. In Iran it's the same thing but uh, I think more, more obvious. In the States, 
uh, how do you how is crime perceived? Well, it's it's interesting because man, the U.S. is such a melting pot. It sort of ricocheted between being a sign of weakness and and relief. But unfortunately, yeah, I think it's you know it makes people a bit standoffish. I mean, I just think overall, like you know, in the U.S., it's like it's it's not as crying isn't as nuanced as it should be. I feel like Canada's quite tough. We're, we're like a hockey loving sitting in the garage type of place and get over whatever you're feeling upset about. I feel like Canada has a very strong, very strong feeling that boys need to be tough and like uh, the girls are gonna be emotional. I think that Italians don't they don't think it's a normal thing for a man to cry. It's pretty much something that uh, is passed through stereotypes. Crying in the UK is probably a bit more like widely accepted so I don't think it's a massive deal here and that's good. To paint a picture of how cultures differ, in Taiwan you can find Li Junlin, a professional funeral mourner. This was originally practiced in the Mediterranean and ancient Egypt, known as Muralogist or Profika from ancient Latin. Meanwhile, in Ghana you can find the Kumasi Funeral Criers Association, a body made up of professional and talented criers. During the Sierra Leone conflict, if you cried, the rebels would kill you. Brides and females of the Taj in China start crying one whole month in advance before a wedding. And now in the UK, Prime Minister Theresa May is appointed a Minister for Loneliness. These are just to name a few. It's one of those things where, like, yeah, you don't have to say what's actually on your mind. You can just cry. Like, it's okay to just cry. I think that we, we are born with a sixth sense, indeed. We actually can understand what a, a person is thinking and if he's behaving normally by only looking through his eyes and his face. But ultimately, these answers are filtered by their minds. Neuroscientist Sophie Scott explains how pupillometry can determine whether you really think an emotion is genuine or not. If we stop asking people and we start looking at people, what you find is that it's still getting through. So what we did, my PhD student Sinead Chen used pupillometry. And what this involves is looking at the size of your pupil, which is the little black dot in the middle of your eyes. What you find is that although people will not acknowledge, they won't say that real crying sounds like real crying, their eyes are giving them away. And in fact, you're even reacting to genuine emotions that you might cognitively think, oh, they're probably not real. And to end, I'd like to quote the Roman poet Ovid. It is a relief to weep. Grief is satisfied and carried off by tears. So we don't cry because we are sad, but it get over being sad, to stay healthy and release stress. Even if crying embarrasses you, it might signal that you've reached a level of stress that's detrimental to your health. For both women and men, tears should be a sign of courage, strength and authenticity. So next time you feel like crying, go ahead.